Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that we have here with you, but we just want to start out by acknowledging who you are as not only creator, but our savior, the one who has written this word that we're able to study and that has preserved it for all this time for us to study. Thank you for putting it on the author's heart. We believe it's John and that it was so relevant to his time, but it is so relevant to our time as well. We ask that you guide our discussion and bring to the surface the things that we need to remember, that we need to maybe change in our own lives. And as, as I always ask, Father, I do not want us to leave unchanged, that whatever you are working out in us and, and need us to know, that we would learn it, and that we would um, just bring it, internalize it, and then also have it come out of us in many ways, but especially in helping others to walk in this in the light, as you've told us that we should and are if we are yours. So we just pray, Father, for our discussion that you would be with us, guide us, your resident Holy Spirit in within us would um, teach us, and that we could come together in like-mindedness. Um, and we thank you for that in advance and ask for it all in Jesus' name and for his sake as well. Amen. Okay, so we are on John, 1 John chapter 2, and in our study of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, because we are looking at all of them, um, we do believe this was written by John the Apostle, the one that was one of the beloved disciples of Jesus. He was one of his inner circle of three, which was Peter, James, and John. Um, that's who we believe wrote this, but that's not the most important thing. It's just that it seems to sound very much like his uh, epistle. I mean, sorry, his gospel, his gospel and also the other epistles as well. There's a lot of common language. But the main thing is this was inspired by God, written down to a group of people. And it is, as I said in my prayer, relevant to us today. Um, we have established that through our study and um and we just know that it we definitely know it's true so as we come into chapter two of first john um we jump into a subject right away and what is that subject advocate and propitiation yes in regards to what In regards to sin, which is one of the main topics of this book, um, sin is definitely, it's something that is kind of currently uncool, right? Um, we have whole groups out there, whole, you know, pastors and big churches and everything that never talk about sin. You know, it's an uncomfortable subject. It's not something we don't like self um, we don't want to see um, who we are in light of what the word says. Um, in the first lesson that Kay did, she mentioned, or maybe it was the second one, she mentioned how there's a lot of people that come to these books and then leave because they're like, I don't, I don't want to know this stuff. You know, I don't want, as I always pray, they, I always pray we're changed. They don't want to be changed. So it's very important that we spend time on the subject because God spent a lot of time on it. You know, God spends, you know, many of the of the books are there's more about sin than there is about anything else because it's the bad news so that we have the good news, right? Um, because there is good news. Sandy, you are in the two words, advocate and propitiation, right? Okay, so we looked up these words this week and we did some cross-referencing on them as well. But the word advocate, what is the Greek word for that? I got Parakletos. Right, Parakletos. Um, you may have heard the term Paraclete, uh, but as we looked up the word, um, several things came to light. When we looked up para Paracletos or Paracletos, however you pronounce it, um, what did you find in your definitions or in your cross-referencing that had to do with Paracletos? Paracletos. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Okay, I got intercessor, consoler, okay, comforter, and advocate. Well, advocate was the one we looked up. Right. Consoler, you said? Yes. Intercessor, consoler, comforter. Comforter. Okay. 
And one who pleads another's cause. Okay. Counsel for the defense. Okay. These are all good because they, um, they're similar. The definitions are similar, but sometimes there's various aspects within it. They give us a better picture, a bigger picture. Um, who else in the word, in the word of God is also called the paracletos or paracletos? The Holy Spirit? Yes. So one of the things that does is it helps us understand that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one, that they have the same characteristics, and sometimes their role is a little bit different um, than the others, but no matter what, their character is the same, their goal is the same, everything is the same, of oneness, and Jesus praised that for us that we're one with the Father and the Son as they are one with each other. But why, when Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit being this um, helper, this, that's another word that we could put up there is helper. Um, and it he's he was talking about when the Holy Spirit was coming, right? And what was the, what was the condition? What was the necessary thing for the Holy Spirit to come? That Jesus had to die. Jesus had to die. I'm sorry, say it again. That so Jesus had sin. to die. Yes. Yes, both are true. Jesus had to die and leave, you know, go to the Father. And there, there was sin that had to be dealt with and taken care of. So both of them are true. Um, it's, you know, not just one or the other. But Jesus specifically said, when I go, the he, he kind of said, I will send. And then he also said, the father will send. So again, that just shows their oneness. It doesn't, it's not contradictory. It's just saying, um, Jesus is going to go to the father and he is going to send the spirit from the father to us. Okay. And the big difference that was going to happen, because the Holy Spirit's been there from Genesis 1. You know, when, when uh, in the beginning, Elohim, that's the plural, the Elohim created the heavens and the earth and the spirit moved over the surface of the waters. So we see references to the Holy Spirit all the way from creation and, and, and he's prior to creation. So it's not the beginning. It's just our beginning was uh, creation. So yes. So the Holy Spirit, Jesus is our advocate. It says it here, and the Holy Spirit is our advocate, intercessor, consoler, comforter, um, counselor for the defense. However, helper is another one. I definitely want to put that one up there. And when Jesus said there is another advocate, he wasn't saying a different advocate. He was saying one of equal value, one of equal stature. OK, so again, it's not sometimes we have a tendency to hierarchy the Trinity, you know, and we've got to be careful with that. If if Jesus does it, it's OK. <laughs> we just need to see them as one and recognize <clears throat> that they are that they are the Trinity. There's three and one. OK, so if you think about this, sorry, I'm about to sneeze. Um, my son is a defense attorney, and one of the things, one of his roles that he has every now and then is called a guardian ad litem, G-A-L, guardian ad litem. And that's the idea of being appointed by a judge to be the advocate, to be the spokesperson, a bit, basically, for someone who is usually a minor, but it can be someone who's mentally impaired. You know, it can just be someone, it can be an adult. OK, and so his role is to listen to everything that's going on and help the judge understand the situation. So rulings can be made for their good. So um, so you, we kind of know the term guardian, but ad litem is a you know legal term that I'm not sure exactly what it stands for. But he, he takes this role very, very, very seriously 
And when some of you know, my daughter was fostering a girl and has since adopted her the whole time my granddaughter Haley had a guardian ad litem. There was there were several people involved in her life, including a counselor, a, like a, a mental health counselor, also um, the the social workers. So you had the um, child advocacy, but then you also had this guardian ad litem. And then of course you had a judge and all that. And then Sophie doing her role. But um, all of these play their part. And it's just, it's easy. it helps me to understand what's going on here. So if you think about this role that Jesus is playing, what it says here, it says, I am writing these things to you, my little children. I am writing these things to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, okay. So those sound like contradictory statements, right? But they're not. It's just saying, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, right? So we talked about, if you look up at verse 9, or I'm sorry, on my page is up. If you look at, back at verse 9 in chapter 1, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we talked about this a little bit and faithful is he's promised it and he's going to do it. There's more, but that's that's a good part <clears throat> for sure. And righteous is God is right, right with himself. God is never at odds with himself. <laughs> when we are right with him, it's because he's declared us that. And then we can walk in that. We can remain righteous. We can do righteousness because we have righteousness applied to our account. But that rightness means right with his standard, right with his, his ways. Um, and it's it seems strange to say or think that he can be both uh, right in all of his ways, which we're not, and right in forgiving us when we're not. It's, it's kind of a hard concept to bring our minds around that he's not wrong to forgive us, that he is right to forgive us. <clears throat> but there's a big if at the beginning of that sentence. If we confess our sins and we looked at the word confess, which means we agree with him and we're verbally, or it could be mentally, but still we're, we're actually putting it into words and asking for that forgiveness he will, because he said he will, and he's not wrong in doing it. So when you see righteous, think not wrong. <laughs> you know, it's another way of thinking about it. But then if you drop down to verse one, it's, you know, coming through this theme that he's saying, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin. But if you do sin, big if at the beginning, if you do sin, we have an advocate with the father. We have someone who is going to plead our cause. Okay, God is already faithful and right to forgive us, but we also have that defense attorney with us is one way of looking at it, right? We have that one who's going to speak for us. So if you think of yourself in a court of law and in God being the, the judge on the throne and we're standing, you know, beyond the bar, but in front of the judge and our, our, um, the, adversary not advocate but the adversaries at the other table telling the judge everything we've done wrong that's the devil and he's doing it all the time all the time and guess what we give him a whole lot to tell god about so you've got one that's telling god that let, even let's say the truth about you he might be lying but he, he could be telling the truth about you because we give him a whole lot of of material um and we're sitting there but instead, Jesus is standing up in our speaking for us and just easily saying to God, covered with by my blood, covered by my blood, covered by my blood. But then you have to remember, we have to confess our sins. We've got to confess our sins. So that's what the whole idea of the advocate, the parakletos, the, it's an intercessor, a comforter, one who pleads another's cause, a counsel for the defense, a helper. I love the idea of helper and comforter, right? Um, so instead, of, it, it's really an anti-adversary, right? So you've got the adversary and then you've got your advocate. 
Um, now in verse two, it says, um, and he himself is, he himself, referring back to Jesus, he himself is the propitiation for our sins. So what did you learn about propitiation? I think I spelled that wrong. I did. What's propitiation? It's a little bit harder. It's one of those, you know, 50 cent words, right? It means to bring something into like acceptability. Okay. Okay. I'm just going to say acceptable. That's a good, that's a good one. All right. Anybody get anything else? Take the place of. Take the place of. Okay. I have down sin is covered and remitted. Okay. Sin is covered and remitted. Yeah. Uh, the word atonement kept coming up for me too. <laughs> did you say atonement yeah and but atonement means covered over so then already have it okay well atonement we did look up some some cross-referencing this week about atonement and so it, it is part of this but atonement itself and propitiation are somewhat different but it but atonement is kind of part of it it's like the under the umbrella of propitiation so another word acceptable is a good word another one is satisfied satisfied okay oh i love that word okay yeah it's a good one um and sometimes when sometimes even we see words within our english version that um and i think of second timothy chapter three where it says that we're adequate you know, like, you know, through the word, we're adequate. And <laughs> I go back to like elementary school or grade school, right? Where you would get a satisfactory or unsatisfactory report card, not A, B, C, D, but, you know, you'd get those midterm or whatever. And I, I always wanted the satisfactory, right? Or uh, accepted, acceptable or adequate, but adequate seems to be, to me, the way we use it most of the time seems to be so minimal, right? It just seems yeah. like, you know, we just barely got by. We're just adequate because that's how we kind of use that word. But when you actually think of this word acceptable or satisfied, or in that case, adequate, which is a different word, but a different Greek word, it means you have everything like you have you have everything has either been supplied for you or you've done everything needed or you have everything needed and when you think of it that way it's a completely different way of looking at it it's like your bucket is full not you barely made the minimum line right okay so satisfied who or what is satisfied is the big deal here what is satisfied? What when Jesus as the propitiation for our sins, and it says not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Okay, so Jesus's sacrifice on the cross not only paid for the ones that will believe in him's sin, that's a very bad grammar sentence, but still I think you got it. Not just those that are someday going to believe in him, but all sins for all all time, the ones prior to Jesus and the ones after Jesus until this whole system ends and there is no more sin, he, his sacrifice paid for that. So, but that's still not propitiation, not exactly. So what is this idea of satisfaction or acceptable? Who is satisfied? Who sees it as acceptable? God, the father, God, the father, right. Um, and so when you think about this in these two verses, you've got advocate and propitiation. So you have two things. Number one, Jesus was the sacrifice. So he's the propitiation. He's not just the sacrifice. Like he, he <laughs> <it's>, okay, <laughs> let me try to explain this, um, as that substitutionary sacrifice, because that's the take the place of part, as that in my place sacrifice, not only did he lay his life down and, and was the sacrifice, he was the high priest that sacrificed. He was both. 
So in this, this, these two verses, um, you see that he was, he is our advocate before the father. He's the one that says, I, as the high priest, find the sacrifice. I brought this sacrifice because I know what I'm doing. I sacrifice myself, but I am the sacrifice too. I'm the sacrificer and the sacrifice. It's really an, a very amazing thing. Um, and in doing so, he satisfied the requirements, not just for himself, because he did that. He satisfied the requirements for all of us. Because if not, we have no hope. We just have a dead good guy. Okay, what is the proof of this? It's not in these verses, but what is the proof of this? Resurrection. Absolutely. The proof that God was satisfied, propitiated, is that he that Jesus rose from the dead. Otherwise, again, we would just have a dead good guy. And there's a lot of dead guys in a lot of different belief systems, or uh, even women, um, men and women that remained dead, but their lives were good, or they, or, or that group of people sees them as good, or whatever. Instead, we have a living Savior. We have one that that not only and therefore can plead for us. But also the proof of the resurrection is the proof that God was satisfied, propitiated. God was satisfied. It's huge. And these two verses is huge. Um, and not just for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. The difference is, um, if you look at like a number line, with this being zero, we're born in negative righteousness. We're born over here in negative righteousness. Jesus' sacrifice brought everyone to zero. The zero doesn't get you to heaven. His righteousness has to be applied. Positive righteousness has to be applied in order for anyone to get to go to heaven. So the big difference is their accounts may have been brought to zero, but his righteousness hasn't been applied to their account. Um, and that's the difference. But, okay, so these are, huge concepts but we look this week at atonement because it's it's been brought up we looked at atonement and i think um i think you were saying that it's a covering which is true atonement is covering so you think about all those years with all of those sacrifices that were done over and over and over again which was god's system so it wasn't wrong it was god's system that day of atonement, but all the other sacrifices as well throughout the year were a covering for sin. Okay. Covered in the sense of uh, it without the, the shedding of blood, it says there is no forgiveness of sin. So, so that was that covering was important um, for the time being, but it pointed them to something bigger and something greater that was coming, which was not only the Messiah, the anointed one who was going to again, teach and, and save them and everything else. But what they didn't really fully understand is he was going to be that propitiation. Um, okay. So think about this. It's sometimes in the prepositions or sometimes in, in a, a verb, for instance, atonement is a cover. But what did John the Baptist say to Jesus when Jesus, I can just see Jesus up on a hill, walking down towards him when Jesus was coming to be baptized? He said, behold, the Lamb of God who comes to, finish the sentence. Did he say cover our sins? Mm, remove. Take, take, take away. away. Take away or remove our sins, right? Um, John said it. Can you imagine, because we hear it, we read it, we see it, we don't see this as huge. But if you had been in the Jewish system all of those years and year after year after year on the Day of Atonement, you hoped that priest came out from the under the veil because if he didn't come out, he was found unworthy 
um, his sins weren't covered. Then, and he went before the judgment seat of Christ or went before the, the uh, mercy seat. And they would, uh, it's, it's not for sure, but it's believed they would tie a rope around them because if they died in there, they couldn't go in after him and they'd have to pull him out. I don't know that that ever happened, but, and, and anyway, that that's traditionally what you hear, but you can imagine as humans, that's how we would think. But you saw that picture when you read Leviticus this week of him, he had to sacrifice for himself and he had to, so you think about how many times he went back and forth. He had to clean, he had to change clothes, he had to go sacrifice for himself. He had to take the coals from uh, on, on the altar. He had to take those coals in a censer, go in, burn a certain type of incense, go under the veil and and, and throw some blood around. And then he had to come back out and then he had to sacrifice for the people, but he had to clean up to do that. And then he had to sacrifice for the people and he had to go back in. So it was a lot of back and forth. Thankfully, it's not a big area. It's it's a pretty short walk, but it's still a lot. It's still a lot. And all of that had to be done exactly the right way in order for them to hope to have their sins covered for another year. That was the hope. And, and God prescribed it. And Aaron was the first to do it and Aaron's sons later. Um, but that that was God's prescription to cover their sins, which was a good thing, but not the great thing. The law was always good, but not great. Jesus fulfilled it. He didn't do away with it. So when Jesus did what Jesus did, remember when he was on the cross, what happened? The veil was torn from top to bottom. With no human hands, no human means was it torn. There was an earthquake and everything else, and it was torn. And that gives a picture of access to that throne that we have. And you read about that in Hebrews, that we now have access to boldly go before the throne of, of the mercy mercy seat on our own and, and don't need that intercessory. We have Jesus as our intercessor. We don't need a human as an intercessor to go on our behalf. So it's um, the difference that John the Baptist was proclaiming was that Jesus comes, not necessarily that day, but in his coming and his coming in the, um, the body of a human and living the life before them and even going through the baptism that he didn't need for repentance, but it was a baptism. It was a process he needed for people to see. But John proclaimed it. He didn't come to cover our sins. He came to take away our sins. And so if you are a Jewish person standing there hearing that, that's radical. That is so different than anything. Here's some information. Sorry, my watch. Um, that's different than anything they had seen or had done or had done before them all these years, with all these, all this time. So just understand that difference, that atonement is great because in the process of propitiation, you are covering, you're, you're covering it in the sense that you're taking care of it, but it's much more because it actually removes the sin. Now, in your cross-referencing this week, how far are those sins removed? As far as east is from the west? That's definitely one of the things we're told as far as the east is from the west. And remember, that's not east Tennessee to west Tennessee or the east coast of the United States to the west coast of the United States. Um, if, you, if you took your geographic position in this world right now and went as far east from it or as far west from it, you basically would be right back where you are. But you've got to understand, God's not limited to our globe. God's east from God's west is infinite. Think about how far his arms could reach, right? So how far is that? That's really far. What else did you hear when you looked up the whole, from? I mean, how far God removes our sins? He casts all my sins behind his back. Yes, cast them behind his back. So it's the idea of not seeing them anymore. 
you know, and it's the idea of God forgetting, but we know that it's not in the idea and the way we talk about forgetting, like, you know, we've got leaky brains and we just forget things all the time. Um, even your homework this week, I'm going to ask a question and you're going, uh, I don't remember that. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that right now. Um, we, we don't retain the knowledge of things, but when God's talking about forgetting, he's talking about choosing not to bring it up again. So when we talk about forgive and forget, that's more the concept we need to keep in mind. Because if I forget mm. my own sins, then I may repeat them. So the idea of forgetting for me, for myself or for someone else would be, I choose not to bring it up again. But like in order to beat somebody up with it, for instance, but just realize that whatever imagery that god gives he, he wipes them out he blots them out he doesn't remember them um he treads them underfoot he gives us a lot of different images or he casts them into the depths of the sea and if you can imagine any of us going out on a ship in the middle of the ocean where it's the deepest i don't know what the deepest would be as a matter of fact even our man-made equipment can't go as far as the deepest of the ocean we can't go that far so that's pretty deep, right? And the idea is they're irretrievable. We can't. So I don't know if you've ever heard this, but I remember hearing different men or like pastors or whatever say, so don't go fishing for them. Like God threw them out there. Don't go taking your rod and reel out and try to get them back. Um, leave them there. So the other is when we read in Leviticus, we also saw the idea of the scapegoat. So you yeah. have the skins kind of placed on the head of one of the goats and that goat was sent off to the wilderness so it's an imagery right you have the one that was sacrificed and the one that was sent off um and you would think the one that was sent off at least got to live but probably didn't live long if they were sent away from the flock they probably were um a they were probably prey to somebody so it's even in, in the New Testament, in Hebrews, it says the sacrifices that were made over and over and over again, when it's talking about the sacrificial system, um, never made perfect those who drew near to God. They were doing what they were told to do. They were doing what was right in the law to do, but it didn't make them perfect. Because it says they, what it did is that they retained that consciousness of sins. It didn't blot out those sins. It didn't um, take them away. And then it says, but in contrast, we now have Jesus's sacrifice. And that sacrifice um, actually does blot out that sin. We're able to move on from it. And we don't have the system of where we have to keep sacrificing. Because that didn't work anyway that didn't do what maybe they were looking for it to do. Okay, so those two verses are extremely important and extremely powerful, and they have to do with sin, which is a, a huge subject. But notice that throughout this book, there is the handling of how we can walk and not sin, but what do we do when we do sin? It's that understanding and that idea. If you go back to the if we says of the first chapter, there were people saying they did not have any sin and that they um, had not sinned. In contrast is if we confess our sins, meaning we do sin and we know it. Um, but there's also you know, walking in the light. As we walk in the light, um, we're, we're not practicing sin. It's not an ongoing part of our life. So that's more of the idea is realizing that um, prior to salvation, which is over here, prior to salvation, everything we did was sin. Even what all of us collectively here would say was a good thing, like loving our children, loving our husband, loving our parents, loving one another, as it says here. Those are all good things, but we could not do them perfectly the way God would want us to do them. There were, therefore, they fell short of God's standard and were in the category of sin. Everything we did. 
after salvation with righteousness, we now have the ability to, at times, not sin. And it should be our, our practice. It should be what we are striving for. But we all know we're going to fail and we're not perfect. And again, if we had no, no yeah. understanding or remembrance of any of our sin, we would begin to think we were some of these people that we never sinned and we have no sin. But having that realization and understanding and that right, you know, relationship with God, we then instead see those times and are conscious of it and are, are, are tender towards it and are aware of it. So, um, okay. So as, as we move on to um, verses, the next verses, verses 3 to 11, to finish out this paragraph, um, there's, we start seeing a lot of the no's, like what, what we can know and what we cannot know. But the next key repeated word is commandment. What did we learn about commandments in relationship to ourselves? If we say we're his, we need to keep his commandments. Right. If we if we say, and, and since by this we know, I love those by this we know statements, that we've come to know him <clears throat> if we keep his commandments. And then it says, the one who says, I have come to know him, which is basically a repeat of the first, the next one right before it, but doesn't keep his commandments is a liar. So we have that contrast between where the proof that we do know him is that we're keeping his commandments, right? And um, so we're gonna look at some of these if you say, or which are a, um, in this case, it's the one who says, that that's the difference. It was if we say in the first, The one who says, um, and this is this is one of the first one. This is the first one, and this one is, I have come to know him. And this is a, a negative application of it. It says, the one who says, I have come to know him, but doesn't keep his commandments is a liar. And then there's a contrast in five, but whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected by this. We know we are in him. The one who says that he abides, here's another one that he abides, abides in what? In him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. I didn't write all of that. So you can write that if you want. Um, so we've got some of these. The one who says, again, which are similar to the ones that we saw in chapter one. And then in verses uh, seven and eight, he's talking. It's commandment, commandment, commandment. I'm not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. Now, this is the beginning of their Christianity. Um, the old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who says he's in the light, so there's another one who says, and yet hates his brother, What is true? Of 
So the one who says he's in the light and yet hates his brother is in darkness. So he's not right. He's not, tr it's not true that he is in the light if he is in darkness and hating his brother. Um, what is one of the things, of course, in verse 10, it says it, but what is one of the things that John is telling us through all three of these epistles that is supposed to be true of those of us who are Christians, those of us who are saved? What should be seen? What did Jesus say that they're going to be, you're going to be known as my disciples? That we have to love one another. Right. We have to love one another. And not that yeah. I want to make too big a distinction between who the one another's are. Like, in other words, I'm not going to say there's certain people you need to love and certain people you don't need to love. But when he's talking here, he's talking about fellow Christians. Okay. There's other places and other epistles that talk about hate, loving your enemies. This is talking about your brethren. This is talking about fellow believers. So a, if, if we were going to have, and I could write it up there, if we wanted to have a category of ways that you could be known as a Christian, and it doesn't say it exactly that way in 1 John, doesn't say, how, do you, how does somebody know that you're a Christian? It's talking about walking in the light. It's talking about knowing him. It's talking about walking as he walked. It's talking about not sinning. It's talking about all these different characteristics that we could list as these are marks of what it means to be a Christian. Number one, that list, if you were to make that list, needs to be for self-examination first. But it can possibly be as a fruit judger like if we're if we're a fruit inspector sometimes there's called it's it's not my primary role to make sure that i know who and is and who is not a christian and walk around you know dubbing you with you know I, my marker you are you are you are no that's not my primary role but god does tell us we will be known by our fruit and and there therefore we can know. So the real only real reason I can come up with off the top of my head is to be able to recognize the the, the wolves from the sheep. Number one, I guess there's more than one. Another one would be to possibly someone who is deceived to help them see the difference. Because someone who is deceived and believes they are saved isn't, and their eternity is at stake. And that was me prior to salvation. So one group of people that's heavily on my heart all the time are people that were like me that were raised in church, grew up in church, go to church and have some assurance from their religious organization that they are something like I'm a member, for instance, as I was, um, and yet I wasn't saved. So that's a dangerous place to be because you're self-deceived and you've been deceived by your system. And that deception, like sometimes they say the, dis the greatest distance between heaven and hell is 18 inches, the distance between your head and your heart. So um, so again, make your list and, and just see from these books, it's one of the best places that you can have it laid out for you that these are the marks of what it means to be a Christian. And are they true of you? And then maybe you might need to use those in helping someone else see the deception that they might be caught up in. But it's not to go around and look at the world because remember, God tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that we are to judge those that are the so-called brethren, people that claim to be Christians. We are to judge them, by the way which is not something that's taught very often in churches today, but we're to leave the world alone, leave the world to God to judge. Because by the way, just like all of us prior to salvation, we sin all the time. Guess what the unsaved are going to do? They're going to sin all the time. So they're just doing, they're acting out their nature, just like we did. 
now that we're on the positive righteousness side, we now have the ability not to sin. Just like he said in the first, I'm writing these things that you may not sin. Okay, so the one who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. That's verse nine. Verse 10 says the one who loves his brother, here's the contrast, abides in the light and there's no cause for stumbling in him. Stumbling usually, now this is an imagery he's giving of being like stumbling through your house when it's dark. It's hard to see, right? You're going to bump into things possibly. That's the idea here. But stumbling usually means stumbling into sin. It's, you know, it's it's trip something that trips you up into sin. Um, but anyway, he's talking light and dark. So even if we just take that imagery. But he says, so here's the word abide. Abide is starting to come up. What can we learn about it? Is if you love the brother... You abide in light. And throughout this, we're doing a lot of light and dark, um, but we've already looked at that even last week and throughout our overview, light and dark is a huge issue throughout this. Um, but the one who hates his brother, which is what we just saw, remember there was one that said, I am in the light that I hate my brother. And it's very definite that that person's in darkness, but it says the one who hates his brother is in darkness, walks in darkness and doesn't know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So it's again, that idea of groping in the dark, but that I, the but it goes so far as to say the darkness has blinded his eyes he doesn't know where he's going and he's walking. He's not just in darkness. He's walking in darkness. Okay. We were there at one point in our lives. We were in darkness and we walked in darkness. We didn't know where we were going and we were blinded by that darkness. But if you go up and see in verse eight, it says the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. That's what happened with us. The true light came and it pushed the darkness away. And now we get to walk in light. We're no longer blinded. Okay, so, so saying, if the light switch has been turned on for us and we're no longer blinded by darkness, do we have an excuse for stumbling? We have we have no reason to stumble and we have no excuse for stumbling because the stumbling is the idea of being in the dark, being blinded, and possibly it's, it's a picture of sin. Okay. In verses, the next few verses, 12, 14, it's these different statements to different people, little children, fathers, and young men. Okay, I'm getting a lot of feedback from someone. Um, I don't know who it is, um, but anyway. Um, in verse 12, it's saying, it, these are some of the I am writing statements too. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you, forgiven you, sorry, for his name's sake. I think I mentioned this in the overview, but remember, whatever God does for us, yes, it's good for us. Yes, it's for us, but it's always for his glory. It's always for his name's sake. So our sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Partly, if you go back up to chapter one, verse nine, because he's faithful, he said he would forgive us and he's faithful to do that. So if his name is at stake in that. And then 13, I'm writing to you fathers because you know him. We've had some no statements up there. People that said they know him and don't, or people that do know him. And what's the proof of that? Um, it says, you know him who has been from the beginning. That is a creation. That is a pre-creation beginning. That's not just your salvation beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you've overcome the evil one. I have written to you children because you know the father. So again, these groups are very interchangeable in what is true of them. 
And then in 14, I've written to you fathers because you know him. He's already said that who has been from the beginning. And I've written to you young men because you're strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. So here's another, the word of God. The word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. And then in verses uh, 15 through, I think, 17, um, it's kind of talking about the world. I mentioned it before. Um, don't love the world nor the things uh, in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. So there's a big contrast there. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the, I did that, I, okay, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. I have taken this, you can take this all the way back to Genesis chapter three in the temptation of Eve. And remember what Satan said to her, look at this fruit, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh was you could be just like God. Or this could make you no good from evil. Sorry, I heard something. Wasn't sure where that came from. Um, and then the boastful pride of life is you could be just like God. So even the very first fall temptation had these elements to it. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. That hasn't changed. As humans, we haven't changed that much. We have changed somewhat, but at the same time, the temptation is there and we're apart from that. So it starts out by saying, don't love the world nor the things in the world. Um, and then in verse 17, it says, and the world is passing away and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God abides forever. Okay, again, a mark of a Christian, right? It's doing the will of God. Eternity is ours. So if we're going to abide forever, it's part of that is we're doing the will of God. That's a proof of that. And it's this contrast. So just look at these verses talking about the world. So again, one of the marks of being in the light is that we love our brothers. Okay, I don't have any siblings that are brothers. So I'm off the hook, right? Sorry, <laughs> I'm not. Uh, I have sisters, <laughs> four. Um, and I remember even as a, an elementary school child, this being taught in a Sunday school class, and I took it quite literally. I was like, you know, I kind of added brothers and sisters because I had sisters. And I'm not sure that's that's not a bad application, because, again, I don't feel like hate is something that should be part of our lives, except for hating sin, um, hating the evil one, maybe, but not, I, I mean, I, so I'm not trying to say any of this is saying only love believers, but we've got to be careful because there's a term that we use all the time called friend. We use the word friend. The word friend is a covenant word. And some of you have studied covenant with me. Some of you may have studied covenant elsewhere, but covenant is what God's about. Everything is covenant. So Jesus said, I am, my flesh and my blood are of the new covenant. So that's where the, you know, the establishment of the new covenant. It is a solemn binding agreement that you only get out of it by death. So it's a life thing. Um, so one of the terms within covenant, though, is the word friend. Abraham was a friend of God. We're Jesus's friends. Remember, he said, no longer are you my servants. You are now my friends. Friend is a covenant word. I take that so literally that I will not call a non-believer a friend because they cannot be my friend. Not in the covenant term of friend. They're an acquaintance. They're a friendly person. 
Um, I may, I may love them because I love them as a human, as a person in my life, or it's in some relationship I might have with them, but I've got, I've got to be careful that I'm not loving someone that is in the world that's in the same way or the way that God would want me to, as I would someone who is a Christian and that I would, but, but like God loved me prior to my salvation, I need to love them and want what's best for them. That's the love that I would want to express, but just be careful because if, if you look at your friend group and most of them are not saved, you are probably walking a line in the world that's not a good place for you to be. So just be careful of that. Verse 18 says, children, it is the last hour. And just as, as you heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have arisen. And from this, we know that it is the last hour. So that's something else you can know, that it is the last hour. Now, there is an Antichrist, like a singular Antichrist that's coming, that's talked about in, in 1 Thessalonians and other places. John is talking about basically like the spirit of Antichrist, which is anti doesn't mean against, anti means instead of, instead of Christ. So John is talking about many, and we've seen them in our lifetime. Dave Koresh, for instance, just being one who believed or professed himself to being Jesus. That's an antichrist. That's in a, an instead of Christ. Um, Jesus <clears throat> obviously was a human and God at the same time, but he was also Christ. And Christ means the Messiah or the anointed one, the long awaited one, the one that was coming. Jesus is the um, another name for Joshua and Joshua that that word just mean their name means saving the people from their sins. But so he's talking about the Antichrist. And then in verse 19, he said, they went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out in order that it might be shown that they were not of us. OK, so apparently there's no. Remember, John is dealing in this epistle and the others with people who are deceiving, pe trying to deceive people. They're claiming things about Christianity, about themselves or whatever that aren't true, and they're trying to teach that. Um, and so if, in, if there was a situation that he's describing here of some that have left the group, and if they've left, he's saying in this, in this way, he's saying they've shown they were not of us. Okay. But this is usually used to beat people up with. Like if you're in a bad situation, a, like a a bad church situation and you choose to leave because it, you you try and you try and you try and you can't affect change and you're just be, getting beaten up and there's no change that's going to happen and you leave this is literally what comes out of their mouths every time so be careful how you apply this um because it can be very much taken out of context okay verse 20 you have an anointing from the Holy One and you all know. So you all know that you have this anointing from the Holy One. And then he says, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it and because no lie is of the truth. So it's, I think that these two verses, if you put them together, the anointing from the Holy One is the truth. Okay, I don't think I'm projecting too much to say that. Then it goes on and says, who is the liar, but the one that denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the father and the son. There are what's called Unitarians out there. And there's some other groups that deny Jesus's deity, that do not deny that Jesus is God. They don't deny Jesus. They say they're following the Bible but they deny that Jesus is God. I know it's, it's very foreign to us, but they're not only denying that he is God, they are denying that he's the Christ, that he is the anointed one, that he is the Messiah, long awaited Messiah, the one that we, that we're the only name by which we can be saved. That's what they're denying. Um, so they may acknowledge the father or God. A lot of times there's a lot of God talk, 
and they may do a lot of Jesus talk. But if you really boil it down, what I think I, I think I mentioned last week and then Kay mentioned it in the video also about having someone who was like a Jehovah witness or come into my house, come to my house. And I didn't invite them in. And what I said at the door was, what do you do with Jesus? I mean, I said more, but eventually I said, we don't believe the same thing. He goes, well, what don't we believe that's the same? I said, okay, let me ask you a question. What do you do with Jesus? And that is the bottom line. What do they do with Jesus? Um, and then from that, you can have a discussion. Um, so, and then in verse 23, it says, whoever denies the son does not have the father. The one who confesses the son has the father also. So again, this is a dividing line. This is a, if you deny the son, you deny that Jesus is God, you deny that Jesus is the Christ, you've denied the son, you don't have the father. You don't have the father. And there's many religions out there that claim to uh, believe in the God of Abraham. Let's just call it. That's one. There's two basic distinctive religions that believe in the God of Abraham. Can you name them? Islam. Islam. Yes. Islam is one. Judaism. And Judaism. Yes. They believe that they believe in God the Father, as we would call him God the Father, but they do not believe in God the Son. And I don't know what they do with the Holy Spirit because I've never heard that, to be honest. Um, so... And many times I've heard people say, we believe in the same God, but we don't. We don't believe in the same God, even though we believe that Abraham was a man and we're sons of Abraham by faith, but not by genealogy, maybe. I don't know about anybody else here, but I'm not Jewish by, uh, or um, I'm not from Ishmael either. Um, so I'm, I'm not of a descendant of Abraham by genealogy. But I am Abraham's son by faith is what the New Testament tells me, because Abraham's faith was what reckoned was reckoned to him as righteousness. That means he believed the truth. He believed in the Messiah that, that Jesus that God told him about, but Jesus hadn't walked the earth yet. Um, so make sure you understand that difference. Um, but it can be a place from which we take them. Like there, there's a lot that we have in common. Like with the Jewish people, we have the Old Testament in common. And we can take, there's a lot about God and a lot about Jesus, the Messiah and the Old Testament. You don't have to take them to the New Testament that they reject. You can actually preach the gospel because it was preached to all of those in the Old Testament. You can preach the gospel from the Old Testament as well but you don't declare them saved and say that they believe in the same God we do because they don't. If they've denied the son, they've denied the father. So just keep that in mind. And then it says, as for you in verse 24, let, let that abide in you, which you have heard from the beginning. If what you've heard from the beginning abides in you, you will also abide in the son and in the father. So what he's referring to here, they would have heard from the beginning, if you go back up in 20 and 21, is the truth. Is this anointing they have in because they they know the truth. That's what they would have known from the beginning. And they're to remain in that. Remember, abiding means living or dwelling or remaining in something. So remain in that. Where, where he doesn't mention it here at this moment, there are people that are trying to come in and deceive them. And he just keeps taking them back to what they know to be true. And this is, this is something that is a good practice for ourselves. If you get into some weird teaching, go back to what you know to be true. And we know this is true. We know this word, these words are true. So stick with that and not some extra stuff. Verse 25, and this is the promise which he himself has made to us. What is that promise? Eternal life. Eternal life. 
Uh, it's awesome promise, right? It's the it's the greatest promise. But we also see that he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins. There's so many promises that he has given to us. But this is the one that we definitely want to hang on to is eternal life. And then he said, 26, these things I've written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. I've mentioned it. Here it is. I'm writing these things because there's people trying to deceive you. And as for you, the anointing you received, go back to verse 20, from him abides in you. So you have this anointing. And then he kind of describes it even more. He says, which you received from him abides in you and you have no need for anyone else to teach you but as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not as lie <clears throat> and is not a lie and just as it has taught you you abide in him so it abides in you and the dot 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 um you abide in him Okay, so if we were to talk about, we've already mentioned in verse 20 and 21, it talks about the anointing from the Holy One. And then it says, you know the truth. And because you know it, <clears throat> no lie is of the truth. Down here, it's saying you have no need for anyone to teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about all things. So truth is teaching you, but who else do we know is abiding in us that teaches us? Holy Spirit. Right. The Holy Spirit. So you can see this anointing is the truth. And we know that God is truth. So there's inner, it's an interchangeable idea, right? So we have this anointing. That doesn't mean that literal oil was necessarily put on your head. That is an imagery. That is a practice. It's not a bad one. I'm just saying it's not that that oil would have done this for you or that even someone laying their hands on you or pouring that oil over your head, that that process does something to you. This is talking about something completely different. This is talking about at your rebirth, at your salvation, this truth came and lived within you. And that truth living within you is that anointing. Um, and it is in, in, we received it from him. It abide, it lives in us. Uh, we don't need someone to teach us. It teaches us all things. It is true. It is not a lie. And just as it taught, taught you, now you abide in him. So it's always that abide in, I, it abides in me. I abide in him. Back and forth. And then in 28, and now little children abide in him. Just said we abide in him. Now it says abide in him so that when he appears, you may have confidence and not shrink or shrink away from him in shame at his coming. What an amazing picture that is. Because we believe, we know that there's a time when we're going to be face to face with Jesus. We're going to be face to face with the Holy Spirit, God and the Son, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. We're going to be face to face with them. At that moment, do you want to be not cocky, not arrogant, but confident. It's like this word satisfied or acceptable or adequate. Do you want to be confident? Like I can hold my head up. I don't have to shrink away because of, of what maybe I'm, I'm ashamed of or what guilt I carry or what I have not confessed or how I've lived my life. Or do we want to be confident knowing that we walked in his light. We walked according to his truth that he put within us, that we listened to what he taught us from the beginning and continued, that we are walking in the light. We're not stumbling, that we're not in sin. We're not practicing sin, that we're not loving the world. We're not in the world with lust of flesh, lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life. We don't have to shrink away. There's other places where Paul talks about this idea that he's jealous for them with a godly jealousy, like he wants to guard and protect them for God and God alone. That's the jealousy. He wants to keep away all of the worldly influence, all of the bad 
people, all of that. He wants to guard them. He wants, he wants that they, that Jesus wanted, that they would be presented spotless and blameless. So that's the, that's the idea here is that we would have that confidence and, and we could hold our head up. I want that. I hope you want that too. If you've never heard or seen this before, I hope through this study this week that at his coming, when he appears, because he's going to, and we don't know when that is, there's literally nothing prophetically that has to happen. Anything that's already written that has to happen for him to return. Nothing. It is that imminent. It could be any second. And I always smile. I was actually talking to somebody this week about some of the stuff that's going on. Today is election day, you know, doom and gloom stuff is being talked about out there. And oh my gosh, everything is either red or blue, blah, 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 you know, whatever um, is going on. I'm not, I, I do advocate you go vote. I do not tell you how, um, but I will say it matters. Do you want to be confident before God? Your vote matters. Um, so don't shrink away from him in shame because of what how you voted it's, it's one of those things that we need to be thinking about and then in verse 29 it says if you know that he is righteous remember the word righteous means right means not wrong means the standard is met he is righteous you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him so again a mark of a christian here's another one that you're practicing righteousness, ongoing action in the present tense, as it says, ongoing action. Lots that we can know. Lots that, like I said, this, this can be a very uncomfortable book because none of us live up to all of this. None of us do, but it's, it's not here. <clears throat> it's here to beat us up as much as it needs to. <laughs> It's definitely self-reflection and a mirror and something we need to be looking at ourselves and thinking about whether or not we are living in the light of this. But the main thing is the light is shining in your life. If you're in the light, you're in the light. And don't just think about, I've got natural light in here right now and I've got a light above my head. We're talking about God kind of light. Like if you went outside and you stared at the sun, it's going to burn your eyes kind of light. The kind of light that, you know, don't do that, by the way. Um, the, the kind of light that does not allow for anything to remain hidden. That's the kind of light where to walk in. So we're a little bit over our time, but not much, not as much as usual. Um and I did want to point out, I've talked about the God is statements of this. Uh, chapter 2, verse 2 says God is, or Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. That's one of the God is statements. And then in verse 22, it's Jesus is the Christ. So God, Jesus is the Christ. That's another God is statement in this book. Um, so we'll take a break and we'll look at... Um, We'll look at some of the, uh, we'll watch Kay's video here in just a minute. I was just checking my notes to see if there was anything else. Was there anything anybody had a question about or wanted to bring up or something that God laid on their heart during this lesson? I can say for me, I uh, uh, Kay's lecture just really opened my eyes about abiding. And I kept thinking all week about him and me, me and him. And just the way she just kept going over that just really spoke to me. So I thought that was great. It's, um, I'm glad because a lot of times I always stop on words because we have a tendency to think we know what these words mean or we kind of gloss over them. That's what I love about the inductive study method is we stop and go, oh, he's repeating this. He's repeating this word. Okay, so what is it? What, you know, you're told to look it up, but look it up or you can look it up on your own and then you could go, well, what, what does that even mean? You know, like what, uh, and then when you start making these lists, if you do, and then you start seeing all the ways, I, I mean, I kind of stopped, but all the ways that abiding has to do, once you understand what abiding is, it really is. It's phenomenal. And realizing that 
it's an ongoing practice. It's not a one-time event. Like, I, I don't know if you've ever heard the term fire insurance policy, but that sometimes is what I've heard people um, describe salvation as in some people's minds. It's like, we all have a insurance policy on our home, hoping that we never have to face a fire, right? But if we do, we have insurance, right? And that insurance is gonna save us from that disaster, right? So we have a tendency to think that that's all salvation is. It's a one-time event that keeps us out of hell. And it has nothing to do with the in-between. But that's what abiding is all about. It has everything to do with the in-between. As we're walking in this world and we're abiding, we need to be abiding in his word. We need to be loving our brothers and, walk, and abiding in the light. We need to be, have the word of God abiding in us. Uh, we need to do the will of God. We need to abide in the Father and the Son as they abide in us. And that anointing, the truth, the Holy Spirit, whatever exactly that anointing is, which I think it's all of that, is abiding in us. And then therefore we're abiding in the father and son. So again, if you think about just that verse, the anointing, if I'm right, that it's the Holy Spirit, or at least he's part of that, you've got father, son, and Holy Spirit right there in that one idea, that one concept. So yeah, I'm glad that spoke to you because sometimes it's just unlocks that little bit of nuance that is so helpful in our Christian walk. Anybody else? I was thinking too that, well, I had been taught that if you walk north and you get to the North Pole, then you start walking south. But if you walk east, then you will never stop walking east. You'll just keep going for eternity. And that's where our sins are. They're gone. And that's, that's the reason, you know, I think from the east is to the west is so good. Yeah, I agree. And it's, it's kind of like I said, if I started where I geographically am right now and went either direction, east or west, I'd end up right back where I am in a way, because there is no end to that. And but that's still confined to this globe, but it's still a good picture. If we kind of unfold that like we do on a map instead of a globe, it's as far apart as it can possibly be. Right. But that's still in our view of things. And yet, when you look at it from God's eternal perspective, we can't even see the end of all of the galaxies we, no, with no equipment that we have. We couldn't make it there in any type of amazing rocket ship that we have created. Uh, we can pretend like on Star Trek or Star Wars and, and, you know, zap and go fast and all that other stuff and just be at another planet. But we haven't achieved that with all that we have in our abilities here on this earth. Um, and so if you've ever looked at anything that helps you understand that, it blows your mind. Distance, 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 distance that our brains can't even comprehend. And God is further than that. And he's just as near as he needs to be. He's right here and he's as far away as we can't even imagine. That's how far away he tosses it, and, and whatever he tosses, he tosses it behind him, which is further away than we can imagine <laughs> that, that we could even potentially wrap our minds around. Um, infinity is beyond our understanding. And that's the beauty of the eternal life that we've got ahead of us, which actually I can't even say it's ahead of us for any of us that are saved. It's already begun. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. So when you begin to think about that, think about the people that aren't going to be where we're going to be because their infinity, their eternal is just as eternal. It's not nothingness. It's not annihilation, which we'd rather believe in some ways. We'd rather believe the people that we love that are unsaved are just going to be annihilated, but they're not. They're going to be in torment just as long as we're, we are not in torment they're going to be in torment. That should be a motivation. I, I Those who have studied Revelation with me will hear me say many times, anytime I begin to study Revelation or anything in times or anything that has to do with eternal damnation, it motivates me. 
more than anything else does, it motivates me to talk to people and to tell them the truth because we have eternal life. They're going to have eternal death and it's just as eternal. Anybody else? I like it. I like hearing what um, God has laid on your hearts and um, his word is just so powerful. And I, I had a friend who passed away this year, but when she first started with precept, Kay would talk about those aha moments, those moments that you're studying. And there's just this, ah, never heard that before. Never thought of that before. Just a little nuance here and there, like the difference in atonement and propitiation, for instance, could just have been a wow moment, an aha moment. And, uh, and I, I hope to never not have those. I always want the word of God to just do something to me and change me and then motivate me to talk to others. Anybody else? Okay, we will finish. I'll, I'll pray and then we will uh, take a short break, come back for the video for those who want to stay. Um, as always, I will send the videos out later and then um, do your lesson four for next week. Lord willing, we'll be meeting again next Tuesday um, if the creek don't rise or he doesn't return. So, um, and I don't mean that facetiously. I mean that really. <laughs> um, okay, so let's pray. Lord, I just come before you today and I just, I want us to dwell. I want us to abide. I want us to think about what it is that we have learned today throughout our week's lesson. As we're coming into next week's lesson, just continue, Father, to, to open our minds, open our hearts, show us your truths from your word and change us. Um, I always ask for that because that's exactly what I want. I do not want to just be blasé. I want to be changed. You have already changed me radically and I just want to keep being changed. And I do want father for all of this to be on our hearts and for people to come to our minds and for you to bring them in the way to our minds and our hearts, our thoughts, that we would see those opportunities when they come and we would take them <clears throat> so that you having drawn them can use us as a tool to speak your truth to them so that one day, Father, we are not ashamed that we didn't take those opportunities, that we are confident that we walked in your light and that light shone before men and shone into their darkness and that we remember what it was like to be in that darkness and how grateful we are that we're no longer in that darkness. Cause us to see stumbling in our lives. Cause us to see those times when we are sinning and we need to confess and ask for your forgiveness. And thankfully you are faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness so that we can and may not sin and that we're walking in your light. We thank you for all of it. Thank you for your word preserved that we can study it. Thank you for the group that's met for the feedback that and the input and just the tools that we have. We thank you for it all and ask for it all in Jesus name and for his sake as well. Amen.